Well, I hope you all are enjoying learning about photosynthesis as much as I am enjoying teaching you about it. And it is strange. When I was in college and I was a biology major, the two areas that I disliked the most, I think, were biochemistry and botany. I just did not enjoy those courses. And now I love teaching it for some reason. I'm not sure why. But uh, I love teaching you about photosynthesis. I hope you're getting uh, at least a little bit of enjoyment out of learning about it. Uh, this is part nine in our continuing saga of cellular energetics. And it's about probably the third lesson that has focused on photosynthesis. This time you can see we're covering pages 171 to 174 in the Campbell Biology in Focus textbook. Last time, we learned, among many other things, about the process of chemiosmosis in the chloroplast. And you had learned about chemiosmosis in the mitochondrion um, qu quite a few lessons ago. And uh, this is a really kind of cool side-by-side -side comparison um, showing that chemiosmosis, the process of chemiosmosis, occurs both in the mitochondrion and in the chloroplast. In both cases, it involves a buildup of a hydrogen ion gradient, a high concentration of protons on one side of a membrane and a much lower concentration of protons on the other side of that membrane. And that gradient, that difference in proton concentration is what drives the movement the, the facilitated diffusion of those protons as they very rapidly push through ATP synthase, causing a rotor to spin inside this special protein. And of course, as you know, every time that rotor spins, an ADP is phosphorylated to make ATP. And a large number of ATPs can be made through this process of chemiosmosis. So there's a lot of similarities between the making of ATP in aerobic cellular respiration and the making of ATP during the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis. Both in the mitochondrion and in the chloroplast, it is an electron transport chain that is the flow of high energy electrons moving from protein to protein down the electron transport chain, that is what pushes the protons into this compartment where they get trapped. And the compartment that I'm speaking of in the case of the mitochondrion is this space called the intermembrane space. It's the space in between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And of course, the compartment in the chloroplast is the thylakoid, the thylakoid space. Um, but in either case, high energy electrons move down the electron transport chain. That causes protons to be pushed into a compartment where they are temporarily trapped um, in the case of the mitochondrion, those high energy electrons are coming from NAD, uh, excuse me, NADH and FADH2. In the case of um, photosynthesis, those electrons are coming from chlorophyll. And the fact that light has struck the chlorophyll, light energy has been absorbed by the chlorophyll, and that has excited some electrons, and so they start moving down the electron transport chain. Um, once the protons are trapped in the compartment, the only way they can get back across the membrane is by passing through ATP synthase. And again, it's the diffusion of protons through ATP synthase. That's what we refer to as chemiosmosis. So pretty cool comparison uh, and a good way for us to review the process of chemiosmosis right there. Okay, so last time, <clears throat> excuse me, last time we focused mainly on the light dependent reactions and we learned how light energy
being absorbed by chlorophyll, excites electrons and causes them to move down the electron transport chain and how eventually that results in the production of two very important high energy molecules, ATP and NADPH. We also learned that um, the light reactions involve water molecules being split, which releases oxygen as a byproduct. So today we're going to turn our focus over to the Calvin cycle. You can think of the Calvin cycle as the sort of the second half of photosynthesis. Um, if, if the light reactions represent the photo part of photosynthesis, then the Calvin cycle is certainly the synthesis part of photosynthesis because we're going to synthesize sugar. And remember, that's the whole point of photosynthesis is to make sugar, which is the food of the plant. So we're going to learn how the Calvin cycle captures carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uses energy from ATP and NADPH to transform those carbon atoms into a usable sugar. And that is the point of the Calvin cycle. So just a couple of uh, things to look for today. Um, carbon from the air in the form of carbon dioxide is going to be fixed to make a sugar, a three carbon sugar called G3P. Another name for it is PGAL. So you may hear me say that because that's, that's what I was taught uh, to call this sugar, but the, the new textbooks call it G3P. And once the G3P is released from the Calvin cycle, it takes two molecules of G3P to make glucose. And that's why we think of glucose as being the product of photosynthesis, the food that the plant can use for energy. Of course, that glucose can be converted into other sugars. It can be stored in the form of starch. Glucose is also useful for plants because they can convert it into cellulose and use it to build their cell walls. Um, you're going to see that it takes three turns of the Calvin cycle to make one molecule of G3P um, because every turn of the Calvin cycle pulls in one molecule of carbon di dioxide. It takes three carbon dioxides to make a G3P. Therefore, it takes six, at least six turns, sometimes more, but at least six turns of the Calvin cycle to make one glucose. So the diagram that we are going to use is a summary of three complete turns of the Calvin cycle. So all of the numbers, when you see the numbers of molecules, we're assuming that the cycle has turned not once, not twice, but three times. Okay, so here is the Calvin cycle. Remember, this occurs in the stroma, the fluid-filled space within the chloroplast. And let's begin by talking about this enzyme. The proper name for this enzyme is ribulose bisphosphate carboxylate oxalase. <laughs> and I love saying that, um, but obviously that's not a fun thing to have to say a whole bunch. And so thankfully, biochemists have shortened that ridiculously long name and into Rubisco. That's the short version of the name. Rubisco, you could argue, is the most important enzyme in all of biology because every plant, every photosynthetic eukaryote on planet Earth uses this enzyme to connect carbon dioxide with a five carbon sugar called RUBP to kickstart the Calvin cycle. This process of grabbing carbon from the air and converting it into a sugar is called carbon fixation. And it's the key to the Calvin cycle. It's what makes the Calvin cycle happen. So remember the name of that enzyme, Rubisco. So Rubisco is going to take carbon dioxide, which contains one carbon, and bond that onto a five carbon sugar that's already present in the stroma called ribulose bisphosphate. You don't have to know the full name. 
The acronym is RUBP. So five carbon sugar plus one more carbon, what does that make? It makes a six carbon sugar. You can see it right here. It makes a six carbon sugar. So after the Calvin cycle has turned three times, that's going to be three molecules of carbon dioxide. Each one is going to bond to a molecule of RUBP. So that's going to make three of these six carbon compounds. That six carbon compound is important, but it's incredibly unstable. It's so unstable that it simply does not exist for, but for just a millisecond. So this, these three molecules of this unstable six carbon compound, they almost instantly split in half. Like almost the instant that they form, they split right down the middle to make six molecules of a three carbon compound. So follow that now. We had three six carbon molecules that split in half. So what does that give us? It gives, a, gives us six three carbon molecules. And that three carbon molecule is called phosphoglycerate. We're just going to call it PGA for short. Okay. That represents the first stable product, or I shouldn't even call it a product. It's the first stable chemical compound in the Calvin cycle. And it is a three carbon compound. You see the little gray dots? Those are the carbon atoms. So it's a three carbon compound. And the reason I'm emphasizing that, the Calvin cycle is sometimes called the C3 pathway because the first thing it makes is a three carbon compound. So keep that in mind. You're going to hear me talk later on in, a, in another lesson about the C3 pathway. That's just another name for the Calvin cycle. Okay. Now, this is a three carbon sugar, but it's not the sugar that we want. We ultimately, or the, I shouldn't say we, the plant is ultimately trying to make glucose. So we've got some steps yet to come. So the next step involves PGA. Here's our three carbon PGA. Um, it is going to pick up a phosphate. See, it already has one phosphate. It's going to pick up a second phosphate and become what's called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. You and I are going to call it BPGA because that's a lot easier to say. This is still a three carbon sugar, but it has more energy than PGA. Where did that energy come from? It came from ATP. See how ATP, six molecules of ATP were used to make the six molecules of BPGA. Now, where did those ATPs come from? Think about it. Where did the plant get those six molecules of ATP? That's right from the light-dependent reactions, from chemiosmosis that happened in the thylakoid. See how it all fits together? Now, we're not done yet because we don't want BPGA, we want glucose. So what happens next is each one of the BPGAs loses a phosphate. So it, it just picked up a phosphate, now it's gonna lose a phosphate, but it's gonna gain hydrogen. BPGA is going to lose a phosphate, gain hydrogen, and become glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which you already know about. That's, that's G3P. Okay, so let's go back and review. Rubisco enzyme combined carbon dioxide with RUBP to make an unstable six carbon compound. That unstable molecule split in half to make PGA. PGA picked up energy and phosphate from ATP to become BPGA. And BPGA loses a phosphate, gains hydrogen to become G3P.
Now, I said BPGA gains hydrogen atoms. Where did they come from? They come from six molecules of NADPH. Where did the plant get those six molecules of NADPH? Think about it. From the same place as the ATP. Both of these came from the light dependent reactions. So the Calvin cycle simply could not happen without the light dependent reactions happening first. Because remember, the light dependent reactions captured light energy and converted it into chemical energy, ATP and NADPH. Now ATP and NADPH are supplying the necessary energy to convert carbon dioxide into G3P. Now why the heck is G3P so important? For one simple reason. G3P is the three carbon sugar that can be used to build glucose. And it says glucose and other organic compounds. Well that's because glucose can be used to make starch and other sugars and cellulose and many other things. But you know, this is kind of the, the holy grail, right? This was the whole purpose of doing photosynthesis. The plant is trying to make glucose. How, do we, how does the plant make glucose? By putting G3P molecules together. Well, notice after three turns of the Calvin cycle, the plant has six molecules of G3P. Most of those G3P molecules are going to stay in the Calvin cycle. Only one of them is going to be released. And that might seem strange. You might think, well, if G3P is so valuable, if G3P is what the plant needs to make glucose, then why not take all of this G3P and convert it into glucose right now? Well, it turns out that's impossible because in order to keep the Calvin cycle going, in order to continue making sugar day after day after day, most of the G3P has to stay in the Calvin cycle and be basically recycled back into RUBP so that the cycle can continue. So let's, let's look at that part. So here's where we left off. This is our six molecules of G3P. One of those six is going to be released. So this is the one molecule of G3P that has now been released. Where did the other five G3Ps go? Right here. They stayed in the cycle. And there's a series of steps which will convert these five G3P molecules into three molecules of RUBP so that the Calvin cycle can start all over again. So if you think about it, five molecules of G3P, that's 15 carbon atoms, which can be shuffled around to make three molecules of RUBP, and you already know why RUBP is so important, because this is what carbon dioxide is going to bond with the next time the Calvin cycle turns around. You'll notice that it does take some energy to convert G3P back into RUBP. Um, every time the Calvin cycle turns, one additional ATP is used in this step right here. So if the Calvin cycle turns three times, that's three ATPs that are going to be used up um, just in this one little step right here. And that's in addition to the six ATPs that were used earlier to convert PGA into BPGA. So just to recap, after three complete turns of the Calvin cycle, one molecule of G3P is released. The other five molecules of G3P stay in the cycle and they are recycled back into RUBP. Well, that's only one molecule of G3P 
that the plant has at its disposal right now. And you can't do much with, with G3P by itself, but after the Calvin cycle turns three more times, see, that'll be another G3P. And once you have two G3Ps that have been released from the Calvin cycle, they can essentially be put together. That's three carbons plus three carbons, and that will make a six carbon glucose. So that's why we think of glucose as being, you know, the sort of the final product of photosynthesis. So um, you can kind of break down the Calvin cycle into three phases. You see how it's color coded with the gray and the dark gray and the blue. So the first part of the Calvin cycle up here, this is called carbon fixation because carbon dioxide from the air is being fixed. It's being grabbed up by the Rubisco enzyme and converted into a chemical compound. And then the second big phase of the Calvin cycle is called reduction because BPGA is going to be reduced when it, when it gains hydrogen from NADPH it gets reduced. The NADPH gets oxidized, but the BPGA gets reduced because it picks up hydrogen and electrons and becomes G3P. And then um, the final portion of the Calvin cycle is called the regeneration step because this is where the remaining G3P molecules are used to regenerate RUBP. Okay, so I talked earlier about the importance of the Rubisco enzyme and how this is the key to making the Calvin cycle work because this is the enzyme that actually grabs the carbon dioxide. You know, the, think about it, the CO2 is in the air. It comes up through the stomata, the tiny holes in the bottom of the leaf. And as the CO2 diffuses into the stroma of the chloroplast, this is the enzyme that picks it up and forces it to bond onto RUBP in order to make that unstable six carbon compound. And that's the key to getting the Calvin cycle started. But you must remember one thing. Rubisco, the enzyme Rubisco, first appeared in early, early photosynthetic organisms a couple of billion years ago, at least a billion and a half years ago. And during that time, there was very, very little oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. So this enzyme initially evolved on a planet that had very little oxygen. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because today, the Earth has a lot of oxygen, thanks to you know, a billion and a half years of photosynthetic activity releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. There's now a lot of oxygen on the Earth. About 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen. And Rubisco is a bad husband. Rubisco is only supposed to have eyes for CO2. If you think about this as a married couple, Rubisco is the husband carbon dioxide is the wife. So Rubisco should only be interested in his wife, right? He should only be interested in carbon dioxide. But Rubisco is a bad, bad husband because he also finds oxygen attractive. And sometimes instead of binding with CO2, like a good husband is supposed to, sometimes Rubisco will bind with oxygen and bad things happen when Rubisco grabs oxygen. Now, because there's a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere of Earth, and also because oxygen is produced in the light-dependent reactions, sometimes there's a lot of oxygen in the chloroplast, especially if it's a hot summer day and the stomata are closed the tiny openings on the bottom of the leaf, sometimes they close up on a hot day, that traps oxygen inside the leaf. 
And as oxygen builds up, sometimes Rubisco succumbs to the temptation and instead of grabbing carbon dioxide, he will grab oxygen. When Rubisco grabs oxygen instead of carbon dioxide, it does not result in the production of the six carbon compound. That means no PGA, no BPGA, no G3P, no glucose. So every time oxygen enters this cycle, it's a wasted turn of the Calvin cycle. It still uses up ATP, it still uses up NADPH, but it does not result in a step towards making glucose. We call that a wasted turn of the Calvin cycle. So you remember when I said it takes three turns of the Calvin cycle to release one G3P, and therefore it takes six turns of the Calvin cycle to make a glucose. Well, that's assuming that every single turn of the Calvin cycle grabs a carbon dioxide. But that's not the case. Rubisco, remember, is a bad husband. So sometimes, and sometimes it's often, Rubisco will grab oxygen instead of CO2. That's a wasted turn of the Calvin cycle. It makes photosynthesis somewhat inefficient. It means that most plants have to turn the Calvin cycle more than just six times to make a glucose. Now this inefficiency is called photorespiration, kind of an odd term, but just know this, photorespiration is a bad thing. Photorespiration occurs when oxygen is picked up by Rubisco instead of carbon dioxide. And so it does not produce a carbon compound. It produces some useless product that the plant has to process and break down, but it, it results in a wasted turn of the Calvin cycle, as I said before. So this is an inherent innate um, inefficiency of the Calvin cycle. And plants, you know, land plants that, that grow on, on land um, have just had to deal with this inefficiency for about 500 million years. And most plants can handle it. Most plants can just live with this level of inefficiency. But plants that live in really harsh environments, extremely hot, environments like the tropical rainforest or extremely dry climates like the desert, those plants are really hurt by this inefficiency of the Calvin cycle. In fact, plants in hot, dry climates have evolved a way around this problem. They've, they, they haven't done away with Rubisco but they have evolved other enzymes that can help compensate for Rubisco's weakness. And we're gonna be learning about that soon. I'm planting a seed in your brain. Okay, so you've already seen, as we learned about the steps of the Calvin cycle, you've seen how important ATP and NADPH are, how important they are to making the Calvin cycle work. The Calvin cycle gets its energy not from light, but from ATP and NADPH. So let's assume that at the beginning of the Calvin cycle or before the Calvin cycle starts to turn, let's assume that the plant has roughly equal amounts of ATP and NADPH. On a typical day, which of those two chemicals is the plant going to run out of first? Now take a minute to think about that. The Calvin cycle uses ATP and NADPH in order to function. Which of those two chemicals do plants run out of first? If you look at it carefully, you should see that it's ATP. 
because to make the Kelvin cycle turn three times requires six plus three more, that's nine ATPs that have to be used up to make the Kelvin cycle turn three times. It only takes six NADPHs. See, ATP is used here and here, right? So to make the Kelvin cycle turn three times, that's a total of nine ATPs that are gonna get used up and only six NADPHs. The point I'm making is that sometimes the plant runs out of ATP, even though it may still have plenty of NADPH. And so it's sort of an imbalance. And so I wanna go back to the light dependent reactions for a moment and show you how plants compensate for this, this imbalance, the fact that ATP is used in greater quantities in the Calvin cycle than is NADPH. So what I'm talking about is referred to as cyclic electron flow. Some people pronounce that cyclic. I don't know which is more correct. I've always pronounced it cyclic. Um, but um, we're going to see how electrons can flow in a cycle in the light dependent reactions uh, to solve this problem. Uh, so um, when we talk about cyclic or cyclic electron flow, it means that photosystem one is going to operate, um, and, but not photosystem two. Okay. Now, why would this happen? In order to make additional ATP molecules, because ATP is used up in the Calvin cycle faster than NADPH. Um, cyclic electron flow does not make any NADPH. It also does not make any oxygen. It, it does involve electrons moving down an electron transport chain, but it's sort of a modified version of the electron transport chain. It does result in chemiosmosis. That's how we're going to make a, lot of, uh, a large amount of ATP. But the reason it's called cyclic or cyclic electron flow is because the electrons are going to leave photosystem one and travel in a cycle back to where they started from in photosystem one. So what in the world is Mr. Cabinets talking about? So let's look at the big picture here. So, so normal light dependent reactions would be light shining on photosystem two, electrons get excited, they travel down this electron transport chain and remember what this electron transport chain does is it pumps protons into the uh, thylakoid space and then chemiosmosis happens and lots of ATP gets made. So the electrons normally leave photosystem two, travel down the electron transport chain until they get to photosystem one. And then what would normally happen is light would strike photosystem one that re-excites the electrons and normally they would go down this electron transport chain and be used to make NADPH. So normally electrons travel in a one-way fashion. What your, your textbook describes this as linear electron flow, meaning the electrons leave photosystem two and they never come back. They leave photosystem two and they end up over here at NADPH. And in this linear non-cyclic electron flow, we make two products, NADPH and ATP. And of course it also makes oxygen because water is split over here in photosystem two. But this is different. Notice some of this has been grayed out Notice photosystem two is shown in gray and all of this is grayed out. And then over here, this entire electron transport chain, including NADP reductase, all of that is gray. That means that has temporarily been shut down. Photosystem two is temporarily shut down. That means water is not being split 
electrons are not leaving photosystem two. Cyclic electron flow means we're only operating photosystem one. This is just temporarily until the supply of ATP is built back up. So how does this work? Light energy is absorbed by photosystem one. All of that energy gets funneled into P700 right here, the reaction center of photosystem one. Two electrons get excited. Normally they would travel this way, but instead these high energy electrons get shuttled down this electron transport chain. That's unusual. Normally this electron transport chain is getting its electrons from photosystem two, but not right now. The electrons are leaving photosystem one. They're being shuttled down this electron transport chain, um, shoving protons into the thylakoid space, building up a proton gradient. So chemiosmosis occurs just like normal, making lots of ATP. But notice what happens to the electrons. They leave photosystem one, and then they come back to photosystem one. The electrons travel in a cycle. So if we're talking about normal light dependent reactions, like the way this normally works, that is called non-cyclic or non-cyclic electron flow. Your textbook calls it linear electron flow because the electrons leave photosystem two and they never come back and they end up way over here in NADPH. They're constantly being replaced by the splitting of water. That's what normally happens. But if the plant is running low on ATP, it already has plenty of NADPH, so it temporarily doesn't need to make any NADPH. The plant will temporarily switch over to cyclic electron flow. Again, during this temporary cyclic electron flow, light energy excites electrons. They leave photosystem one. They go down the cytochrome complex, which is this electron transport chain over here. And the flow of electrons creates a proton gradient, which leads to chemiosmosis and it makes ATP. It does not make NADPH. It only makes ATP. The electrons travel in a cycle or a circle. That's why it's called cyclic electron flow. And because pho photosystem two is temporarily shut down, there's no water being split and there's no oxygen being given off as a byproduct. Okay, so now I want to refocus your attention back to the Calvin cycle, the process of carbon fixation, which happens at the beginning of the Calvin cycle. And I mentioned earlier that the Calvin cycle itself is sometimes called the C3 pathway because the first stable chemical that's made in the Calvin cycle is a three carbon chemical called PGA. So the Calvin cycle, another name for it, is the C3 pathway. And this leads me to a topic that we're going to investigate uh, next time in our next lesson. And so I just want to plant another seed in your brain. For most plants on Earth, the Calvin cycle, the C3 pathway, is the only carbon fixation pathway that the plant has. So what does that mean? That means most plants on Earth are what we call C3 plants. The C3 pathway, the Calvin cycle, is the only carbon fixing process that they have. Now, there are other plants that are not C3 plants that we're going to talk about next time. There are plants that are known as C4 plants, and we're going to learn about some plants that are called CAM, C-A-M plants.
but those plants still have a C3 pathway. Every plant on Earth has a C3 pathway. Every plant on Earth uses the Calvin cycle to make G3P and eventually glucose. If the plant only has a C3 pathway, and if that is the only mechanism that it ever uses to fix carbon, we call that a C3 plant. C3 plants always use the enzyme Rubisco to fix carbon, and by fixing carbon we mean um, bonding carbon dioxide onto RUBP. That's a five carbon sugar that gains one more carbon from CO2 and it makes eventually it makes a molecule called PGA. Remember though Rubisco has a flaw. It has a weakness. It's not a good husband. Rubisco has an affinity for oxygen, meaning it sometimes grabs oxygen instead of CO2. That is bad. That is called photorespiration. And that is a flaw. It is It creates inefficiency in the Calvin cycle. It delays the pr production of glucose. It makes it much more difficult for the plant to produce large quantities of glucose, and most plants just have to live with this flaw. But I mentioned before, there are some plants, like C4 plants and CAM plants, that have evolved a way to compensate for this inherent weakness that Rubisco has. All of this is really just setting the stage for our next photosynth uh, photosynthesis lesson. And it also reminds me of this week's extra credit phrase that pays. The first 10 students to email me with this phrase will earn extra credit this week. And the phrase is, Rubisco is a bad husband. Rubisco is a bad husband. That's your extra credit phrase that pays, and that is the end of this lesson on photosynthesis. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you soon.